the desert plants. More recently, their work has been involved in studying C. elegans, fungal pathogens, etc., aiming to uncover the molecular mechanisms and adaptive traits in the face of heat, drought, nutrient limitation, and pests. Sous Lab combines computational and experimental approaches. They employ computational modeling and target laboratory testing to study mechanism of adaptation, function of novel genes, organization and function of metabolic networks, and the chemical and the neural code of plant-animal interactions. Her group is also interested in developing translational research programs involving biomass maximization on the drought in bioenergy crops. So has published more than 100 papers in the area of, of plant genomics and genetics. I've been fortunate a postdoctoral research associate in Sous Lab at Stanford from 2016 to 2019. I have learned a lot from Sue, including scientific writing, communication skills, spirit of teamwork, algorithm thinking, and many others. To date, I'm still benefiting from Sue's scientific training. It's my honor to invite Sue to give us a presentation at the Biomedical Informatics Research Seminar. Her title, uh, her, her seminar title is Challenges and Opportunities in Plant Science. Without further ado, let me present our seminar speaker, Dr. Suri. Thank you so much, Jin, uh, for the uh, uh, really generous introduction. And thank you and Su Jin for inviting me to give a talk today. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to share with all of you some of my thoughts on the challenges and opportunities that I see in plant science today. So today is a pretty tough world to live in. Uh, you know, not only do we have a global pandemic on the rise, but also we've had record-breaking hurricanes and wildfires this year. And we all know that these are exacerbated by global warming and it's projected that the intensity and the frequency of these natural disasters are only going to increase. So it's pretty difficult not to feel helpless these days. Uh, and so I try to focus on what I do best, which is research and science. And being a plant biologist, I have a lot of hope uh, in plants. So I think that plants hold a big key to a sustainable future. For example, plants can generate four times more energy than what all of us consume just from the sunlight. And they can also sequester half of the carbon dioxide that we generate. And so globally, I think that uh, plants have a huge potential to mitigate global warming and help improve um, the situations in the world. Now, plants are already uh, transforming our uh, society. So, you know, plant-based technologies um, are increasingly becoming more prominent in our societies, uh, such as, for example, um, we now have styrofoam made from plants. And so if any of you have gone to Costco, uh, the packaging that they use for meat and fish uh, is actually made from uh, it's styrofoam made from corn. Also, we have, we have now memory foam from made, uh, made from plants, disposable plastic, even vaccines. And more recently, there's been a big um, sort of uh, surge on uh, plant-based meats like fried chicken, and hamburgers, and so on. And so, uh, you know, I think plant-based um, technologies and economies will become a much bigger part of our society going forward. And um, it's quite exciting and plant science will have a big impact um, in our world. Uh, an important sector where plant, um, plant, um, plants are going to make a big contribution is energy. So this is a graph that shows you the projected sources of energy in the next 30 years or so. And as you can see, uh, biomass from plants is going to be the largest um, source of primary energy for us um, in the next by 2050, along with wind and solar. Um, so this is interesting and exciting, but at the same time, um, it's a little scary because plants um, actually require a lot of land. 
um, to produce energy. So this is a graph that shows you um, the amount of greenhouse gas uh, produced uh, as a function of the amount of land that's used to generate a unit of energy. And you can see here that biomass from plants, uh, even though produces a lot less greenhouse um, gas emissions than um, non-renewable sources of energy like coal and natural gas, um, but it also uses up the most amount of land which we are increasingly um, uh, getting less and less of because of population increase and other demands we have for land. So I think that a huge challenge that we face in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, at least in the realm of plant sciences, is how to get the most out of plants while minimizing resources and reducing environmental impact. And so, um, in order to be able to figure this out, uh, ideally, I think it would be great to have um, uh, something like a programmable plant um, where we can actually you know, think about designing and engineering plants at will, especially um, for them to be able to withstand a suboptimal conditions. And in order to do that, we really need to understand all the major processes that are going on in plants, such as development, reproduction, metabolism, defense and physiology, and so on. And we need to understand not only how these processes work on their own, but also how they work together in conjunction. And um, at scales ranging from molecular to um, organismal and perhaps ecosystem levels. And so this is a pretty tall order. And I think you know, bioinformatics and computer science have a huge role to play in this. And I think it's a, a really ambitious goal. And I don't know if it can become a reality in our lifetime. Um, but if, you, if we try to sort of you know, shoot the moon here like this, um, we can think about what are you know, some of the major bottlenecks um, to get there. Um, and I think really one of the biggest bottlenecks that we face in plant sciences and in biology in general is that um, most genes that have been revealed from genome sequencing still have um, completely unknown function and their functions are not even predictable based on sequence similarity. So these pie charts are meant to show you uh, the proportion of uh, genes that encode proteins that are not even pre predictable by, uh, for function, even by sequence similarity that are represented by these uh, black uh, pieces of the pies. The green pieces of the pies represent the genes <clears throat> that have been experimentally characterized. And so we have a lot of confidence about what they do. And then the blue parts of uh, the pies represent those genes that can be predicted for function based on um, the protein similarity to, um, you know, uh, others that have been characterized experimentally. And another point I want to make from this slide is that this problem is not just limited to plants. As you can see here, uh, for um, very intensively studied uh, organisms such as human, yeast, and mouse, and so on, they still also have a substantial portion of these uh, what I call unknown genes. And so what I want to talk about today is, um, you know, some of our efforts and others' efforts in trying to figure out how we can um, ascertain uh, function to these black uh, portions of genes. And so from now on, I will just focus my discussion on Arabidopsis. So uh, as probably most of you know, uh, we can really um, think about function uh, of genes in three different ways, biological process, molecular function, and cellular component. And these are different uh, ways of ascertaining gene function as defined by the Gene Ontology Consortium, which is um, uh, a project that's generating these controlled vocabularies that a lot of scientists are using to um, annotate data, omics data, and genes, and genomes, and so on. And so, uh, as you can see, this is uh, a little bit more updated than the uh, previous slide I showed you. Uh, 
Uh, we still have a substantial portion of genes that are really not even predictable based on the comp existing computational tools, based on sequence similarity. And so, um, you know, how can we uh, think about um, inferring gene function to, for example, biological process? Now, um, traditionally in biology, most gene functions have been uh, um, assigned based on uh, what I call top-down approaches, uh, in which a particular biological process, say fertilization or development, uh, was used to try to identify components that um, component genes that are involved in carrying out that process. And often um, this approach is used genetic approaches where you mutate genes and see if they are defective in the biological process that you're interested in. Um, this is a process that has been used in um, Arabidopsis for the last 40 years or so. And um, that's really led to a pretty small proportion though of the genome that's been experimental characterized. And so um, while it's a very um, um, useful process, it's super slow and takes a lot of time and um, effort. Um, on the other hand, you can think of then uh, ways of um, predicting biological process from the genes themselves. And uh, this is an approach that's been used actually also for quite some time, um, and originally sort of uh, developed in the East. And this is a data-driven uh, bottom-up approach to ascertain um, a biological process uh, to a gene. And the basic tenet of this um, approach is that if we can get a lot of information about genes and what they do and their patterns, for example, in terms of gene expression or location or interactions with other genes or, or similar evolutionary patterns or physical interactions, all of these attributes can be used to link genes to each other. And then we can say, okay, well, all of these genes that are colored here are involved in flowering time. And so then any other genes that have no um, known biological process um, annotation, we can say, okay, since they are, um, you know, behaving very, very similarly to the genes that are involved in flowering time, we can infer that these genes of unknown function could also be inv involved in flowering time. And so this approach is called guilt by association. And as I said, it was um, uh, largely initiated in the East um, field uh, with people like Ed Marcotte and others. And about 10 years ago, we collaborated with Ed, uh, Ed's group to try to do this um, in Arabidopsis, which was the first um, sort of genome scale co-function network that was created. And then um, the last 10 years, we try to see if we can use this approach to assign functions to genes and validate them. And a number of years ago, uh, I wrote a review with Mark Marek Mudwell um, to try to summarize um, the process uh, that we could use uh, to assign gene function to biological process in this type of data-driven bottom-up approach. This is a quite complex slide. Um, but the main point I want to make is that, you know, we can take all the omics data and, uh, you know, link genes to each other and then try to infer these biological processes uh, and then characterize the, the genes um, to validate the inference. And really, we found that this part of experimental validation, not surprisingly, of course, was really the most time consuming. And, uh, didn't really get us too far in terms of um, increasing the number of genes that we can assign gene functions to um, in a confident way, right? Even though we have lots of predictions in terms of um, whether that really could speed up experimental validation was still questionable. So that's kind of like where we are in terms of um, assigning biological process function to genes. Um, I think that we have to either rethink the, the process or figure out ways of accelerating um, the throughput of experimental validation. And both sort of approaches are valid. And I think it'd be sort of interesting to think about, uh, especially, um, you know, with an audience 
like you who are more experts in um, bioinformatics and computer science. Um, so now I'd like to switch gears to talking about um, inferring molecular function to genes. Now, this is in a way a more difficult problem even than assigning biological process because you can't really use these types of guilt by association to assign a biochemical um, activity or, or a, a mechanistic sort of molecular function to genes and proteins. And so, you know, I think this is another area where some innovation creativity can come in, especially, you know, in conjunction with and collaboration with uh, computer scientists and bioinformatics folks. Um, so, you know, how can we go beyond sequence similarity in assigning uh, molecular function? So a few years ago, we tried to think about this problem and thought, okay, well, can we use characteristics that are not sequence similarity or homology dependent, but still are in, in important characteristics uh, of molecular function? So we kind of tested this idea on a set of um, uh, proteins or a function um, uh, called the transcriptional regulation. So transcription factors and other regulators that control gene expression of other genes. Um, so to test this idea out, we took um, the part of uh, these unknown genes from Arabidopsis, which were um, grouped into about 800 families that had uh, more than two members. And then we um, asked uh, which of these families are enriched in these uh, characteristics that are found um, uh, frequently in transcriptional regulators. So these, and, and these were characteristics that are not sequence similarity um, dependent. And so the characteristics that we used uh, were a high percentage of disorder residues. These are residues uh, in the amino acids of proteins that are um, not likely to go into um, crystal sort of three-dimensional structure. Um, and somehow they're enriched in transcription factors. And people don't know really why uh, there would be an enrichment of disorder residues and transcription factors, uh, although, um, more recently, people from um, people like Rick Young and others have ascertained that transcriptional regulators actually need to work in um, big complexes uh, often, and this disordered regions help them to sort of get into these big, big condensates. Um, and then another uh, uh, characteristic that we used uh, to infer these transcriptional regulators is the presence of nuclear localization signal because we posited that transcriptional regulators would have to work in the nucleus. And the third factor that we used was the um, ability for uh, proteins to activate transcription in yeast. And this was um, sort of uh, information that we garnered from uh, large scale protein interaction data sets. And using this um, non sequence homology based features on these unknown gene families, we identified about 40 families representing about 200 genes. And so uh, in the last few years, we have been um, trying to characterize some of these genes to see if um, they are transcriptional regulators and also to see what they work on, what their molecular mechanisms are. And so being in just one lab, we, we can't characterize all 43 families, of course. And so we've been just focusing on a few and um, what I'm going to talk to you about today are just very high level information that we have on two families, the Chiquita family and the Flow One family. Um, and so we found um, um, families that were giving us really interesting um, sort of uh, information that were completely unexpected and um, in areas that we didn't think that we would be going into studying. So the first family that we started characterizing is called Chiquita, um, Chik1 to, to be short. Um, and this protein that's completely unknown for function, when you mutate it, uh, it leaves the, it renders the plants um, dwarf. So they're about half the size of wild type. And this dwarfism is seen in all organs that we examined. 
as you can see here, flowers, seed pods, roots, and leaves. And so for a long time, we thought that this gene was a positive regulator of growth because when you get rid of the gene, you have reduced growth. But when we started looking at earlier stages of the plant development and in a, in a higher resolution manner at the cellular level, we realized that actually this plant isn't, the mutant isn't always smaller than wild type. In the beginning, they're actually bigger than wild type. Um, but somehow through development, there's a switchover and at maturity, they become much smaller than wild type. So this is curious. And we've actually done a lot of molecular characterization to come up with um, a working model at the mechanistic level. And all the details of the data, I'm not gonna show you today, but just, I will um, summarize um, the work from this gene uh, by saying that this gene uh, basically seems to be involved in um, proliferation rate of cells um, in early development. And so when you get rid of the gene, you actually proliferate um, a lot faster. Uh, and then that increased um, division and growth early on actually leads to an earlier switchover to differentiation and expansion uh, represented by these orange cells here, okay? So because it grows faster earlier, it just basically stops dividing sooner. And then it just kind of stops growing sooner uh, as opposed to wild type that continues to divide and grow. So you might wonder, well, that's curious. And yeah, it'd be interesting to know what the molecular mechanism is. Um, and we are looking into that right now. And our, our current uh, set of data suggests that this might be actually a checkpoint uh, regulator of cell cycle. Um, but that's an interesting um, and, and unintended consequence of this discovering this gene is that it might actually be a gene that controls a trait that's an ideal trait for Green Revolution 2.0. And uh, let me just illustrate what I mean by this briefly. Um, so may, some of you may know that the Green Revolution that saved millions and millions of people um, uh, in the last century um, was basically mediated by um, natural variants of wheat and rice that were dwarfed, okay? And so it's represented by this um, first two panels here. So when these wheat and rice plants grow, sometimes they grow too tall and wind and rain can make them fall over. And this falling over basically caused a lot of reduction in yield. And so when Norman Borlaug found varieties that were much more dwarfed, it actually prevented the plants from falling over and then it increased yield quite a lot. And um, that really was a pivotal moment in, in saving um, lots of people's lives from um, starvation, uh, especially in India um, and uh, in other parts of Asia. Now, it actually wasn't just dwarf plants, in fact. It was, um, the Green Revolution was really dwarf plants plus a lot of water, irrigation, and a lot of nutrients, fertilization. Um, and these are really not sustainable um, ways of um, growing plants and becoming less so. Uh, part of the problem with the uh, dwarf plants was that they were always dwarfed, even in the beginning. And so when you have much smaller plants um, at first, you end up with a lot more open um, land space, which will increase evaporation a lot, right? And so um, you use up a lot more water than you need to if if the plants were bigger uh, when they were younger. So really an ideal green revolution trait is combining early vigor. So when they're younger, uh, the plants are bigger, uh, combining that with um, dwarfism at the end, okay? Which is exactly the mutation that uh, in Chiquita leads to. And so um, this is just to illustrate that, you know, um, this uh, unknown gene that we characterize um, is really sort of revealing some really interesting behavior that could be very um, useful in agriculture. Um, uh, it's just another very brief uh, example that I wanna give you is with another gene called Flow1, which um, we discovered is involved in seed germination and sensing water. And again, I'm gonna give you a very, very brief overview of this. 
Um, so, you know, seeds actually have to make a, a huge decision uh, when and whether to germinate, you know, because once they make the decision to germinate, there's no going back really. Um, uh, and, you know, if the conditions are ideal, they may actually uh, suffer dying or um, uh, very bad for, for the plant. And so if the circumstances are not good, they might want to stick it out and wait, not germinate. And so the seeds actually take in a lot of signals uh, before deciding to germinate. Um, and the biggest of these signals is of course water. But nobody knows uh, to date uh, how plant seeds are sensing water and uh, how, what the molecular mechanism of uh, water sensing and germination would be. And so this unknown gene that was discovered, I'm going to skip all the data uh, just to give you a highlight summary. Uh, we found this gene that's um, really specifically expressed in the dry seed. Um, and it changes its biophysical state from being dissolved to being these small um, condensates that are, behave like liquids to also becoming more gel-like solid states. And these changes in um, their biophysical um, and material states seem to control whether they can sense water potential and therefore whether they can um, germinate or not under different water potential. And we see this uh, um, incredible variation in this biophysical states of this protein across the plant kingdom going down to algae. And so, um, you know, we actually have a paper um, that's under revision right now um, and, uh, you know, going deeper into the molecular mechanism. But again, this is another example um, that is giving us um, a, a molecular handle on a really important trait in agriculture that we really uh, didn't intend to study. Uh, but this gene flow one seems to be uh, important in um, allowing seeds to germinate um, uh, uniformly and rapidly, which is actually a very important trait in, in um, agriculture and an important trait in uh, increasing a yield. And in fact, you know, farmers have actually used a pr pr practice called priming for many, many, many years where you actually give it some water and then before it starts to germinate, you actually dry it back out. And then when you plant those primed seeds again, they germinate much more uniformly and faster. And, but nobody really knows what the mechanism is for this priming is. And we think that flow one is maybe the sensor that's mediating this process. And that we may be able to um, design uh, seeds that will germinate uh, at however we want them to germinate in different conditions if we can manipulate flow one. So I hope that, um, you know, I was pretty clear in giving you these couple of examples of characterizing these unknown genes that are leading us to really interesting places. Um, but I have to say that while uh, it's been super fun and I'm very excited to continue working on these genes, it's still been quite slow. And, you know, and, and, and I would say that, you know, we're still a little far away from figuring out what the biochemical molecular function is of these two genes. So um, it's a little frustrating um, to see how we can really accelerate um, this gene function identification. And I wanna try to illustrate my point uh, using a jigsaw puzzle. So I feel like you know each of these jigsaw puzzles is a gene, and we are all trying to figure out what the gene looks like and what it does and how it fits to the big picture. And any of you who've actually played jigsaw puzzles, you know that in the beginning it's really slow, right? Uh, because you don't have the context. But when you actually start to be able to put in these um, contexts then the discovery process really accelerates. And then, you know, you know, putting the right finding and putting the right pieces in the right places becomes much, much faster. 
So I'm kind of thinking that maybe we have to think about changing the, the game plan and, and, and see if we can figure out a way of identifying these um, anchoring points in biology that could really accelerate uh, people to put their pieces onto or hang their pieces onto. And so together as a group uh, or community, we can um, solve the puzzle together. And so um, I guess a couple of years ago, I started an initiative called the Plan Cell Atlas, um, where, you know, instead of really thinking about trying to solve this problem of figuring out what all the genes do uh, individual in individual labs, I wondered whether we could sort of from the beginning um, try to think about doing this as a community. And so this Plants at Atlas is meant to be a community uh, resource to map all of the components of plant cells from uh, molecular to organismal scales. So where um, proteins and molecules are at the nanoscale level um, shown on the right here to which subcellular compartments they're located in um, and then to which cells and which tissues and so on. And so uh, we have a couple of sort of review uh, slash perspective articles on this, if you're interested in um, this type of idea. Um, and to enable this community to be established, um, uh, we have created a website here and a Twitter handle. And just to illustrate some of the goals of this initiative um, is to, first of all, to define what all the cell types and states and transitions are, both qualitatively and quantitatively, and map all of the proteins and other molecules these, to these cell types and cellular structures and figure out how they work and interact with each other uh, in four dimensional space and then integrate these data to generate multi-scale models of cells and hopefully tissues. And um, I feel that this type of approach might, if successful, might answer uh, lots of fundamental questions um, and also enable us to think about designing plants more effectively. And more, most importantly, to help accelerate uh, the discovery of gene function by providing these um, anchoring points, if you will. And um, you know, these are just a few examples of all the areas of plant biology that we that I think that uh, this plant cell atlas initiative could really uh, enable. Uh, both fundamental questions and different types of um, uh, processes. And so in order to make that into a reality, what do we really need to do? Um, how can we think about creating an infrastructure um, as a community? Um, and so this is just a scheme of uh, one, scenario, one possibility. Uh, on the left is panels uh, representing different types of data we would need. Uh, so protein interaction data, for example, a uh, bunch of different imaging data, and uh, single cell profiling data. And all of these data we want to integrate into um, databases and modeling platforms. And we also want to be able to visualize these data uh, in a lot of different ways. And so um, there are different phases of this initiative that one can think about building out. And um, I think that, um, again, computer scientists and bioinformaticians and modelers have a huge role in making this into a reality. And um, what we're trying to do right now is to actually, um, you know, recruit uh, people that are interested in becoming a part of this community. And so we uh, actually held a series of um, Zoom web, uh, web uh, workshops uh, earlier this year. And all of the talks and discussions from those workshops are available um, for you to view on our website here, plantcellatlas.org. It was actually quite a successful workshop where um, about 400 people sh um, showed up and uh, in uh, one or uh, more of these three sessions. And they were mostly um, early career scientists. So over 70% of the people were early career scientists. Um, and um, we got folks from not only you know, in the US, but also um, Asia and Europe and uh, South America and Australia. And uh, 
and on this website, of course, there's a way for you to become uh, part of the member by joining the, the email list that we have. Uh, so I hope that you would consider checking this out and be maybe becoming part of the community. Um, the more diverse the community, I think the better. And this is just beginning. Um, so we're uh, about to um, put the final touches on a roadmap a manuscript that we're gonna share with the community for feedback and then hopefully publish. Uh, and there's lots of other activities going on there. So I'd like to wrap up uh, by thanking uh, people that have been working on the, some of the projects that I talked about and um, a lot more people on projects that I haven't talked about, but on the, in the unknown projects, Flavia Vasi really started and, and uh, is leading that project. She's the one who's characterized, um, discovered and characterized Chiquira One. And Yaniv Doron is the one who discovered and characterized um, Flow One with um, lots of collaborators and help from uh, research assistants. And then uh, Plant Cell Atlas uh, with a bunch of people from Carnegie uh, and NYU and UC Berkeley and LBNL were uh, part of um, you know, the project uh, and also trying to um, identify subcellular locations of metabolic enzymes. And these are some of the funding agencies that are supporting our work. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, I hope I was somewhat clear uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions.